you've spent any time at the beach, you may have been to an oyster roast. Here in North Carolina, in tidewater communities and along the Outer Banks, people buy a bushel and fire up the grill when it's time for a celebration. In fact, oysters have a long history in North Carolina. They were a staple of colonial communities and became such an important commodity after independence. The competition between local oyster pickers and out-of-state dredgers led to the so-called Oyster War of 1891. The 20th century saw declines from overharvesting, shoreline development, and habitat destruction caused by inland logging and farming. But that is changing and oysters are back. Along with other popular shellfish like mussels and clams, oysters are recognized today as good for our diet, good for our economy, and good for our environment. What you might not realize, though, is that shellfish have been a part of human diets for as long as humans have been human. Learning about this past can help us make better decisions about how to use them and other foods in the future. I'm an archaeologist here at NC State, which means that I study the human past through the things that people made and left behind, rather than from the things they wrote or that were written about them. Using examples of archaeological research from around the world, I'm going to take you time traveling on a culinary history of the oyster roast to help reveal the complex relationships among humans, their environments, and their societies. So, let's begin. To help us travel back in time, try to imagine our earliest human ancestors searching for their next meal. Where are they? What are they doing? I'm willing to bet that a lot of you see a lone hunter trekking across a wind-swept tundra, spear in hand, and hot on the trail of a woolly mammoth. And you wouldn't be wrong, for some times and places. But what if I told you that on this trip, we are headed to a rocky shoreline at low tide where a band of foragers is knee-deep in the surf, gathering mussels and snails? Not only is shellfishing one of the oldest ways humans have fed themselves, but it may be one of the reasons that humans are, well, human. Fossil and DNA evidence indicates that our species, Homo sapiens, evolved hundreds of thousands of years ago on the continent of Africa. Geologists and climate scientists have determined that our ancestors periodically experienced conditions so inhospitable that they were on the brink of extinction and likely survived in small, isolated pockets. One of these pockets was on the southern tip of South Africa at the site of Pinnacle Point, where archaeologists have found the remains of daily life from over 150,000 years ago in caves within walking distance of the shoreline. In these seaside sanctuaries, ancient humans learned to live off of a diet of land and sea mammals, forage plants, and shellfish, like mussels and snails. These same ancient humans developed novel technologies. They learned to heat treat local stone to make sharper and more durable tools, to mine minerals for pigment, and to drill and shape small shells into beads. Some archaeologists think shellfish are behind these innovations. The theory goes like this. Mussels and many other marine shellfish accessible from a shoreline live in the intertidal zone, which means that they are covered by water at high tide and exposed at low tide. Lunar cycles create more pronounced high and low tides with the best chances of collecting during the lowest of the low tides. Over the long term, individuals with cognitive abilities to mentally map and schedule food gathering in ways previously unnecessary may have had a slight advantage over their peers. Furthermore, regular access to shellfish, which are rich in protein and omega-3 fatty acids, may have improved brain development. Together, this possible evolutionary jump has been called the brine revolution. Now, before you jump on the brine revolution bandwagon, consider that more recent excavations on the Mediterranean coast of Spain at the site of Bajondillo Caves have documented evidence that Neanderthals, a different species of ancient humans who spread from Western Europe to Central Asia, were also gathering mussels and other shellfish as early as 150,000 years ago. But unlike Homo sapiens, they didn't spread to every corner of the globe. Either way, eating shellfish has been part of human life ways for as long as we've been around. Since those earliest shoreline experiments, humans have foraged for shellfish wherever they could. Mussels, clams, and oysters are abundant, nutritious, stationary, and docile prey. Furthermore, the wetland and coastal environments they inhabit are often rich in many other plants and animals that people have depended on for food. Around the world, archaeologists find evidence that people didn't just shuck some oysters or bake some clams, but 
In many places, shellfish were such an important part of diets that archaeological sites are rife with trash pits and midden heaps full of nothing but shells. If you were to come across one of these middens today, it might look like an inconsequential scatter of shells like the one in this photograph, but there are thousands of these sites in the southeastern United States dating back thousands of years. The Broad Reach site in Carteret County here in North Carolina is one of the largest. Across an area of over 10 acres, archaeologists have uncovered over a thousand shell-filled pits and midden heaps that represent the accumulated remains of countless small meals, a record of diet and habitation that begins over 2,000 years ago and ends sometime after the arrival of European settlers. If that isn't a long-term sustainable food system, I don't know what is. But abundant and dependable sources of food can lead to so much more. Move a little south to coastal South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and you'll encounter scores of sites with enormous mounds of shells, like this example from the Sapelo site in Georgia. Nearly 5,000 years ago, communities came together for massive feasts of oysters and clams, so massive that they used the shells to build circular and crescent-shaped mounds hundreds of feet in length and some with shell deposits over 10 feet tall, all enclosing large open plazas. Along with the shell, we infer that these were feasting locations from the pottery, plant, and other animal moraines found at these sites. Why this feasting tradition did not spread as far as North Carolina remains an open question, but there's no denying that at these shell mound sites, the bounty of the coast provided new opportunities for people to come together to mark community and identity. If shellfish provided abundant foods for people around the world, they also provided a buffer against long-term ecological change and unexpected climate catastrophes. For example, in a long and well-dated record of shell-bearing sites along the central and southern coast of North Carolina, clams dominated until around 1,500 years ago when they were replaced by oysters until 800 years ago, after which clams returned as the dominant shellfish at these sites. These changes weren't food fads, but likely reflect local long-term changes in climate and sea level that affected water salinity. Oysters are more commonly found in salt water and show how humans can successfully adjust their diets to changing climate conditions. Archaeological evidence from the Jamestown colony in Virginia makes this adaptability of both humans and shellfish apparent on an even shorter time scale. When European settlers first landed on the shoreline of what they would name the James River over 400 years ago, the region was experiencing one of the worst droughts in a thousand years. The documentary record tells us that colonists used oysters to make it through that lean time but did so while pinching their noses, for many Europeans saw oysters as a famine food to be eaten as a last resort. New research at Jamestown, however, shows that the drought improved conditions for oysters to grow because local waters became more salty. Without these abundant oysters, the early death toll at Jamestown may have been even higher than it was. And now we're almost back to the present day when the rise and fall of commercial shellfishing, culinary exploits, agriculture, and industry make for a far more complex, productive, interdependent, and fragile food system than those I have described. There's no going back. That is not the lesson I hope to transmit from the past. But going forward, we can recognize that what has made us successful in a biological sense as a species and in a social sense as nations, states, and communities is our ability to adapt to environments, to make use of what is available, and to roll with the punches. Solving our future food problems will most certainly depend on making changes to how we use big ticket items, staple crops like corn, wheat, and soy, meat and poultry, eggs and dairy. But it will also depend on how we make use of what is right in front of us, abundant, productive, ecologically sound and renewable resources like shellfish, which have strong ties in tradition and community.